And then came this wonderful woman, Esther Doyle, to the college to teach theater. Not teach it, but to direct it. She was an English professor. And first play, You Can't Take It With You. I got a part in You Can't Take It With You. I played Paul, the father. And I must tell you that I am not a night person. Even though I'm in theater, I am a morning person. I like the mornings. I function better in the mornings. I do not function well at night. Well, there's this great scene, and you can't take it with you, where Paul, the father, comes on stage and listens to a whole scene. And every night at rehearsal, I would fall asleep <laughs> on stage. And Miss Doyle, as we knew her, they said, what are we going to do? I said, well, when the show comes, I'll probably stay awake. Well, we can't take a chance. We're going to send you back into the cellar to make fireworks. Uh, that's what the, the part of Paul did in The Father. He made fireworks in the cellar. So they got me off stage back and then brought me back on so I wouldn't fall asleep on stage. Well, that was the beginning of it. And you become the host for the restaurant in St. Petersburg, Florida. If you know St. Petersburg, it's for old folks. It was the green benches and all that kind of thing. And I became the host and I became a celebrity host. I could tell people's names when they left the restaurant. They would leave, go out the door, and I'd say goodbye, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, or whatever their name was. Then they'd be halfway up the block and they'd come back and say, do you know us? Do we know you? And I said, well, you're the Smiths, aren't you? Yes. Well, and this happened over and over again. The newspapers got a hold of it and tested me and they came and I could call people by name. And it wasn't difficult, folks. In those days, every man wore a hat. And when they came in, they put their hat on the rack. And every hat in it stamped the man's name. <laughs> And while they were eating, I'd look into the hat, get the name, and remember it when they left and call people by their names. In that time, Miss Schuler, Miss Evelyn, read about it in a newspaper that we were performing at Highlands University. And she knew Dr. Johnson down there, who booked the shows. And she called him, and he said, yeah, I got them through uh, prior men's agency gave her the date and she in long hand wrote a letter to the agency and said if ever those kaleidoscope players she never could pronounce kaleidoscope <laughs> to the, her dying day she called us kaleidoscope if ever those kaleidoscope players came through again uh, we have this old theater and we might like to have them come to raise some money to help pay for the piano, the grand piano, the Steinway. Being a good agent, he remembered that the next year, and we were doing Androcles and the Lion, Shaw, and booked us into the Schuler Theater, I think, for $200, the show. And we did, and we came, and we played the show in the Schuler, and Miss Schuler ran the museum, which is the Schuler House, where Rick Trice lives. That was the museum at that time. And she had a reception for us. Miss Schuler's receptions were notorious. She got a cake, and what wasn't eaten of the cake, she put in the freezer and saved for the next reception. <laughs> so everybody in town knew it. But at any rate, that's a sideline. While we were at the reception in the front room there of the Schuler House on 4th, 5th, 4th, 5th and Rio Grande, right? The Trice House now. <clears throat> a couple of men in town, John Lackey, Leon Rubin, a few people, got me off in a corner and said, you know, this is a good thing. We have a racetrack here, but we don't have anything to do at night except drink. And uh, what would it take to bring your kaleidoscope players back here and do some more shows, not just pass through with one show? And I said, money. And 
They said, how much? I said, I haven't any idea. Well, where are you going tomorrow? Well, we're going to Highlands University. Dr. Smoker said, I have a meeting. It was a, this was a Tuesday night, Wednesday. I have a meeting tomorrow afternoon. I am going to Las Vegas. Could you send your company on and we'll call a meeting here in the morning and you talk to us. Can you bring us a budget? And I said, yeah, I guess. And so I can remember the motel. I can remember the room that I was in. I st the motel has been torn down. There's a Sonic there now. Remember that motel? What was it? The Melody Lane? No. I, I remember the, forget the name. But at any rate, I, use, I remember sitting on the floor using the bed as a desk, trying to figure out. We didn't have little calculators either. Had to do all this adding and subtracting about how much money. So Dr. Smoker came and picked me up and brought me to the international room at the International State Bank. Joe Delisio, Charles Delisio, Leon Rubin. There were 17 businessmen that he had rounded up by that time, 10 o'clock in the morning, to hear my presentation. And I talked to them, and Lois Donati was there. Lois was president of the Federated Women's Club that brought us with Androcles and the Lion as a matter of fact. And there were 17 p business people there, and I laid it out that we would ask our agent to end us in Raton. That would be the last show, whatever we were going to tour, and we would do three more shows. And I would send out a few more people because there was no scenery, there was no lights, there was nothing. There were burlap curtains, folks, in the Schuler Theater. Burlap, except for the front curtain was green with gold fringe on it, but the, the, the legs and the back curtain were burlap, brown burlap curtains. And I gave them a figure, and they thought about it and said, we can do that. Reminds me of a chorus line, I can do that. <laughs> Remember the boy says, I can do that when he sees his sister dancing. At any rate, they decided that they could do it, and John Smoker came up with the idea that he would go around town to businessmen and they would guarantee me, I think it was $3,300 for four weeks of shows or something like that for, for a whole company. And we had to build scenery, et cetera, et cetera. And that he would get a hundred business people each to put up $9 in case of a loss, no, up to $100 in case of a loss. And that summer we came and he had to collect nine dollars from each one of these guys or so that had put up money. Now I think it's 30 some of them, I forget. At any rate, we did come back the next summer and that was our first full summer and we did four shows in four weeks. And that was Kaleidoscope. Well thanks for coming everybody, appreciate it. But there I was sitting in the airplane in Phoenix, Arizona. I'd just been to the Western Arts Convention and I was coming back to Colorado Springs. I was in seat A, you know, that's the one by the window. I was looking out the window and watching them load luggage onto the next plane. And all of a sudden, there it was, my bag. I saw it, this big blue behemoth. It was a bag, not my luggage. It was the exhibit, the display unit I use in my exhibit. It was very large, bright blue, and it was being handled, and they were wondering how to put it on the run with the track going up into it. And I screamed out, that's my bag, that's my bag. And I rang for the stewardess, as we called them in those days, and she says, what's the matter? And I says, that's my bag over there, that's my bag. And she said, a lot of bags look alike. And I said, not that one, <laughs> that one is mine, that blue thing right there, it's my display unit. And she believed me, and she called, and it was already loaded, and they got the bag, and they brought it back and put it on my plane. And I thought later on, when someone said I ought to be telling some of the stories and experiences I've had in theater for 60 some years, that the title would be, That's My Bag. <laughs>
he introduced me to the fact of Jimmy Driftwood and the Ozark folk music, which I knew little or nothing about. I did know the Battle of New Orleans, that song. I remember driving out my driveway in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, going to the Stillman to the college to see a basketball game. And I was going down the hill around the curve, and on came this record on the radio. In 1814, it took a little trip, along with Colonel Johnson, now finally suspended, took a little bacon and it took a little beans. And I thought, this is the greatest song I've ever heard. I, don't, I pulled over to the side of the road. I didn't want to miss it. And when it was over, I honked the horn because I couldn't applaud. I just honked. I thought, this is great. I really loved it and, and didn't know that within a couple of years I'd be meeting this man that wrote it, Jimmy Driftwood, a folklorist, school teacher, who wrote these songs as history lessons for his students. The only way he could keep his, as he called them, big old boys, interested, he taught in a one-room schoolhouse, eight grades, and the big old boys, the seventh and eighth grade, weren't history, weren't in his interest in history, but they were interested in hearing the songs. So he wrote the songs, and he wrote Battle of New Orleans and so forth. And biggest ego of any person I've ever met, but the most generous person, just wonderful, and he very talented, but this monumental ego that he had. And he never moved to Nashville. He would be on Grand Ole Opry, he'd go down and be it, and come back home to his ranch up in Mountain View, Arkansas. So from Panama City, because they said, this show isn't going to happen unless you come up here. So I went to Mountain View and lived with the Okies, the Ozark Okies, for three years. Happened unless you come up here. So I went to Mountain View and lived with the Okies, the Ozark Okies, for three years. I just keep coming up the story. My name is Bill Feagan. That's who you are, Bill Feagan. Uh, this uh, building was not uh, originally called the Schuler Theater, you know. When he uh, decided that it would be built, it was called the City Auditorium for years, and then for one year or so, it was called the Rex Theater, when it was a movie theater also. But uh, when he died in 1919, just four years after it opened, the name was changed to Schuler. Dr. Sch he was the first doctor in Raton as well as uh, mayor to 